Okay, so this will be the fourth online lecture for ECE 341 random processes. In the lecture that we had just previous to this, we talked about joint probability density functions. That is a probability density function that's a function of two random variables. We called it x and y. Uh, we did some calculations and work with those. Today, we're going to talk about taking those joint probability density functions and getting a smaller dimension probability density function, something called the marginal probability density function. And then we will also look at what happens when we take functions of two random variables and how we can work with that and get the resulting distribution of those derived random variables. In the case of a probability uh, density function, joint probability density function, and wanting to find the marginal, it's really simple. We've already dealt with this uh, previously for the discrete case. We're just going to do it for the, the continuous case now. Um, the idea of a marginal is you reduce the dimensionality of the probability density function by integrating out, um, summing out, if you will, the unneeded or unwanted variable. So in this particular case, because we have only a two-dimensional probability density function, that's the joint probability density function, the marginals are going to be univariate. So we might be interested in something, for example, of the distribution right, of a random variable x, and I want to get that from the joint distribution fxy. So we're going to take this from fxy, and what we need to do in this case is we need to get rid of the y dependence. So we're just going to basically integrate out, get rid of all the, the, the interaction or reasons um, that we would have any kind of y in there. So I just take that joint probability density function and integrate it with respect to y, right? That's going to get rid of all the y's, and what's left over is the f of x. We're essentially summing out all the uh, contribution of y. In a similar way, we can find the marginal distribution fy of y. It's the same sort of an idea. It's just now that x is the unneeded variable, so I'm still going to take that joint distribution fxy of little x little y, and I just sum out in this case because it's continuous. We integrate, right? We integrate out the dependence on x. So marginal distribution is here pretty easy to, uh, to, to state. I should make a comment that here, even though we're doing that integration and that integration seems easy, um, we must include in here, right? You must include, you must include what is what is the range space for this uh, single variable, and in this case, either x or y. So you must include the range of support, right? The range of support um, for either x or y, depending on whether you wanted the marginal of x or the marginal of y. And so that's part of the part of the answer that must be included. The proof on this, if we were going to prove this, is really easy too. Um, so the proof, if we wanted to think about it, let's just think about what is the CDF fx of x. That's the probability that x is less than or equal to little x. We can get that from the joint distribution. We had seen this as uh, part of our, our properties before the joint um, distribution as well. I'm going to take out fxy, little x, little y. And what do I want to do? I want to get rid of everything to do with if with y. So I'm going to take dy here and have it go minus infinity to infinity. So I get rid of all of that because fx doesn't depend on y. We're letting all values of y um, be accounted for. So I integrate on all of those. The fx of x says the probability that x is less than or equal to some value little x. So the outside limit is going to go minus infinity to x. Because my limits of integration include that variable x, I'm going to go ahead and replace. Um, I'm going to go ahead and replace my variables in here, right, of x um, with a dummy variable of, of integration as well. And um, I need to do that, and then I'm going to also need the differential element over here. So let me just erase those in. And instead of x's, I'm going to use something that won't end up confusing me. I'm going to use a u and a du, something along those lines. So the CDF univariate CDF of x, right, probability that x is less than or equal to little x, um, we can get from the joint by uh, integrating over that part of the of the xy plane, right? So if I looked in the xy plane here, so here is random variable x, here is random variable y, probability that x is less than or equal to some little x, right? We come in here, we find our little value x, and we include all of this stuff over here, right? All of this part of that plane. We can highlight that in there. Everything over there, it's a half plane, basically. And we know in order to do that, we're going to have to integrate, right, from minus infinity to x, that's going in this direction, right? Going minus infinity up to and just reaching that point, little x. And then we had to have y go from minus infinity to infinity. That's what's going to give me that half plane over there. So we certainly see this as a starting point that uh, this uh, this uh, CDF for x can be gotten from the joint distribution. 
Well, how does a probability density function relate to the, to the CDF? We know little fx of x is just equal to the derivative with respect to x of fx of x. We have an expression for fx, and we can go ahead and do that derivative. In this case, the only place we see an x is in the, in the upper limit of integration on that, on that outside integral limit. And so we can again use Leibniz. Um, I'll let you go back and look in, in your notes about Leibniz, but we can use Leibniz. So I'm going to say Leibniz, Leibniz here um, to the rescue, to the rescue. So Leibniz tells me how to handle this, uh, this derivative with respect to x of this double integral. And what we end up getting on that is uh, basically we are going to get rid of that outside integral and we're going to evaluate everything that's left inside at that upper limit x. And so what do we get? We get an integral minus infinity to infinity of the joint distribution fxy of what? Well, I'll put in that u as being x, so I'm going to get an x comma y dy. Uh, something along those lines, which is what we had said at, at the beginning. So the proof here, not hard to do. Um, we can get that straight from uh, just our, our CDF kind of uh, approaches that we had done before. All right, so marginals, no big deal. Um, let's do an example that maybe shows these guys at work. So I'm going to go ahead and carry out an example of trying to find a marginal distribution from a joint distribution. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and allow myself two random variables, x and y, and I'm going to allow them to be distributed uniformly, uniformly. They're going to have a uniform distribution on the unit circle. So this will be um, something where there's definitely dependence between x and y, uh, but uh, the, the range space or region of support as x, y is the unit circle. And what I'm going to want to do on this is I'm going to want to go ahead and find the marginal distribution, and let's, let's just do the f x of x case. Um, f y of y would be very similar, something along those lines. So we've got the problem set up. We just need to get some, um, some, some pictures going here to make sure that we understand all the uh, constraints that might be going on in here. So I'm going to go ahead and draw in the xy plane, so I'm going to have my xy plane, a picture that helps me uh, visualize the region of support for this pair of random variables. We know that they are uniform on a unit circle, so I'm going to go ahead and draw in this xy plane the unit circle. So I've got my unit circle in there, it's got some radius 1, right? And I know that where we have probability density, let's go ahead and try that again, where we have probability density is going to be just nicely within that unit circle. We said it was uniform on that. So um, in the xy plane, where I've got some probability density falls on that, that unit circle shape, that circle shape, that disk shape. If you imagine this as a probability density function coming out of this xy plane, what you would see is we'd get a circular looking table. And it's a flat table because the distribution was uniform. If I wanted to think about the joint distribution on this then, we know fxy of little xy is going to be either a constant or zero. So we could put the zero otherwise on there. When is it something else? When is it that constant? It's where x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to one. That describes a unit radius circle. Um, if I take a look at this guy, right, um, double integral of sxy. If I, if I integrate over that region of support, I just get the area of that circle. I know the area of a circle, though, is equal to pi r squared, so pi r squared, but I have radius here equaling to 1, so I have a total area of pi. Um, that's what would happen if I double integrated fxy and the constant were just 1. I need that constant to scale this so that the overall integral, that double integral, ends up giving us unity. So I can do this one kind of as mental math, and I know then that I must have a probability density function, joint probability density function, that has an overall height of 1 over pi. I take that height 1 over pi times the area here, right, and I end up getting 1. So that tells me that this joint distribution would have an integral equaling to 1, which is exactly what I needed. So um, got a got a full model now for this joint distribution. X and Y are certainly dependent on one another. Take a look, for example, of this value if we were looking at X equaling 0. If X was equal to 0, if we conditioned on that, for example, right, Y could take a pretty range, pretty big range of values. It could go from minus 1 to 1. But if I chose a different value of X, something closer to 1, for example, right, the range of values of Y that would be supported, that would be possible, would be smaller. So clearly, Y depends on X and vice versa. These guys uh, do depend on one another. 
In order for me to find the marginal distribution fx of x, if I want to find my fx of x, I do need to integrate, right, my joint distribution fxy, little xy, right, over um, all the values of y. I have to get rid of those y dependencies, so I'm going to get something like that. In this particular case, when I when I take a look at this, what I need to do is I need to collapse everything down onto that x-axis. Uh, this means that I'm going to have to integrate, um, just like those red lines are, are oriented, I'm going to have to go from the lower part of the circle to the upper part of the circle, okay? And um, I'm going to have to uh, be able to do that uh, for all possible values um, that are that are that are there. Um, okay, so how do I how do I end up doing that in this particular case? Um, my dy right elements. DY says I'm going to be building up little differential elements in Y, and I'm just going to stack them together. So I'm showing these as like little dots. Those are each of the little DYs. And where do they go? They go from the lower part of that circle to the upper part of the circle, um, something along those lines. That, that boundary, right, that thing that is going to make the limits of integration here. Um, technically, I guess we are going ahead and integrating all of y, right, but it's zero outside of that circle, so it's zero here and zero here. So the only thing that survives over is integrating on the on the boundaries of that circle. Well, what do we know a circle is described by? We know a circle is described by an x squared plus y squared equaling 1. Let's solve that for y. y equals 1 minus x squared, and then we're going to take the square root and we have plus or minus. So the minus sign, right, is going to be corresponding to this lower point. The plus of that guy is corresponding to the upper point. So my limits of integration in this case are going to be minus the square root of 1 minus x squared, right, to the upper limit of root 1 minus x squared positive sign on there, something along those lines. So these limits of integration are reflecting that kind of odd um, region of support for this joint distribution fxy. What is the distribution uh, value over that, that region, the only place where it was non-zero? Well, we'd already computed that out. That was 1 over pi. And then we're just doing a dy. This particular case is, is an easy integral. We're integrating a constant with respect to y. And so we are just going to get, well, we have that constant out front, 1 over pi. Integral of a constant just gives me y then. And that y has to go on the limits, which is a minus root 1 minus x squared, right, to the upper one, which is root 1 minus x squared, something along those lines. Going to go ahead and plug these guys in, and we end up getting what? I'm going to get a square root of 1 minus x squared minus, and a minus again is going to become a plus again, a root 1 minus x squared all over pi. Well, those two terms combine together, and I end up getting something that is going to be a 2 by pi times root 1 minus x squared. So we might sit there and say, geez, we're done. I've got that integral done. I've gotten rid of the y part. I've got my fx of x. So far, it looks pretty good. So I'm going to go ahead and give that in there. But we're missing something, right? We are missing the region of support on x. We must include that region of support on x. Otherwise, we're going to have a complete, incomplete expression. So I'm going to just point here and say without, right, s sub x, this is incomplete. We know that this is an incomplete expression. So let's go back and look at what I had for my original joint distribution. I am collapsing everything from y. I'm integrating out the dependence on y. So everything along all these y values, they all get pushed down onto that x-axis, if, if you will. And what we see is that what's left is going to be something on this region, right, for what x can take. And it's going to be an x value going from minus 1 to 1. So we are going to get values, things that integrated, right, according to that integral we just completed, as long as x is between minus 1 and 1. Anything outside of that, there was nothing to collapse. It was just a bunch of integrals of zero, and I would have gotten zero. So now I can just add in this last piece, and I should have my final, I should have my final result. So including this region of support information, I get my fx of x, right? And I'm going to get here uh, what I previously calculated, 2 by pi for root 1 minus x squared. And that's for what? Well, that is for absolute value of x less than equal to 1. I could have also written this as minus 1 less than equal to x less than or equal to 1. They mean the same thing, right? And it's 0 otherwise. And now I have my overall marginal distribution, something like that.
If I go ahead and I plotted this guy, if I wanted to plot out what this probability density function looked like, it's not too bad. So I'm going to go ahead and give myself an axis now that I've gotten back to a univariate case. It's the standard old plot that we'd expect. I'm going to look at different values of x, and I'm going to look at what's their overall density, kind of how likely they are to fall in that general vicinity of different values of x. If I go ahead and I plot out this function, if I take a look at this guy, um, this, this function over here, f of x being equal to 2 by pi root 1 minus x squared, this describes essentially an ellipse, an ellipse in there. If I put in x equaling 0, for example, I'm going to get 2 over root pi. That's something pretty close to 0 0.6, so I'm just going to give a value there at x equaling 0. That's 2 by pi, something along those lines. If I go out to x equaling plus or minus 1, plus or minus 1 squared just gives is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. I'm going to be coming out to a 0. So if I come out here at minus 1 or I come to 1, I'm going to be hitting 0. So we get something like this. This is an even function in x because of that x squared in there. And so I'm going to get something that is going to be following an ellipse, something along these lines something like that, and then outside the region it's going to be zero. You could use a computer to plot this more accurately if you want it, but we know that it's likely that x is going to have smaller values, right, um, more so than larger values, because the probability density, the marginal distribution, is larger in those regions. That is, again, not a big surprise. If you come back here and look, right, there is way more area. This is all that uniform area. There's way more area there when x was small than there was when x was a larger value in magnitude. Right? So we do expect that the overall likelihood that x takes one of those extreme values, minus 1 to 1, would be smaller. Okay, so there's an example of doing this uh, idea of a marginal distribution. Just the, the key points on there, you integrate out the variable that is of not interest, right? You should be left with an expression that has nowhere in it that variable you integrated out. If I was looking for the marginal x, you should not be seeing a y in that expression, right? And so um, no y's in, in, in a f x of x in the marginal for x, and there would be no x's in the marginal f y of y. The other thing that you just absolutely need to make sure that you're doing is you need to make sure that you're including that region of support information in there. Without that region of support information, it is incomplete. Okay, we're going to go ahead and switch gears now, and we're going to start talking about functions of two random variables. So let's go ahead and look at that. We'll go ahead and look at functions of two random variables. Um, functions of random variables we had dealt with before. We had had um, a bunch of conversation about this, and uh, we are we are just interested in, in being able to um, take functions now of more than one random variable. Um, we could do something like the following, for example. I could sit there and say that we know um, some random variables, so let's go ahead and know random variables x and y. What do we mean by knowing them? We know, right, the joint the joint distribution functions, the joint distribution. We know that joint distribution in there. We could create a function of these random variables, so we could get derived random variables, for example, derived random variables, such as maybe I'm going to create a new random variable w. That's just the sum of those two, x plus y. Or maybe I make a new random variable v, that is the quotient of those two random variables. Okay, So we need to be able to uh, take functions of these random variables and be able to understand the, the behavior of that derived random variable. What I will say is that we can use we can use um, the previous the previous what what we did for univariate right use the previous the previous um, two step step process process to find for example the resulting derived derived random variables CDF CDF and PDF or PMF. So we could say PDF or even a PMF, um, something along those lines. Okay, so if I was going to take um, a look at this in a continuous random variable case, um, we could do something along the following lines of uh, this two-step procedure. What is the two-step process? I guess I should say that as well. The two-step process, the two-step process, that was just our CDF method. This two-step process was, right, find the CDF, right, and then differentiate. So at least um, uh, that's the idea in in 
in simple in simple terms. Okay, so let's look at the case of a continuous a continuous random variable. Let's let there be a new random variable w that is some function, we'll call that function g of random variables x and y, right? My CDF method would say that the CDF of w, fw of w, right, is equal to the probability that w is less than or equal to little w, right? Which is equal to what? Anytime we're talking on a probability of, of this guy, um, that's a probability of then g of x, y being less than or equal to w, okay? Well, that probability is going to be something involving a double integral. What are we going to integrate? We're going to integrate over the condition g of x, y, right, is less than or equal to little w. Whatever that looks like, that's what we have to integrate over. And then what do we integrate? We integrate our joint distribution fxy, little xy. And I'm going to put in here a dx dy, but just a reminder, the order there really can be adjusted to match whatever's easiest for you to do. This particular integral might not be very fun or easy to do. So I will just make a little note here. I'm just going to say um, this integration, this integration, integration, this integration is um, probably or might not, maybe I don't have to say is, there might be cases that are okay, um, might not, might not be fun and or easy, right? Taking the derivative, taking the derivative, derivative of, right? The derivative of cap f w of w, cap f w of w, with respect to the variable w is usually, is usually, easier. So if you can get to the CDF part, usually getting that probability uh, density function afterwards through differentiation is usually easier. We will follow this up with some examples here as we go along. How about for a discrete random variable? Well, for a discrete, discrete random variable, um, we could still talk about having some derived random variable w that is a function g of discrete random variables now x and y. We are interested in um, basically uh, the probability density function or the CDF. We can usually jump, we can jump straight. We can jump straight to the probability mass function because it's a physical probability and that just involves summing. So we could say something like PW of W, the probability mass function of this uh, desired random variable W, right? It's just going to be a sum. What are we summing over? We're summing over all points x, y, right? that have this g of x comma y being equal to that w. If it was a CDF, we would go less than or equal to that w, but we're just going to do the PMF uh, directly. And then what do we put in there? Well, we put in the joint probability mass function PXY of little x, little y. Um, this sum, even though I've drawn it as a single sum, is summing over pairs of points, and it might show up or be easiest to compute as a nested sum. Um, usually this is a lot easier. So usually, usually uh, the discrete case, discrete case, discrete case is 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 easier is easier than for the continuous RB case. I'm going to go back and just make sure I said something right. We were talking here as a very quick one, right? We were talking about functions of two random variables. We know those two random variables. We want to find the joint distribution. We're going to follow usually a two-step process. That two-step process that involves the differentiation, though, really that's for the that's for the uh, continuous random variable case. It just isn't going to make much sense for the discrete. Continuous random variable, you find that CDF, and then you differentiate it to get the probability density uh, function. For discrete random variables, you can jump straight to probability mass function because it's just adding up points. It's just going to be adding up points. There might be an infinite number of them that you have to add up, but it's just adding up points. I will make some suggestions in here that you go ahead and read the book. Read the book. Uh, read the book examples. Um, read the book examples. Um, they're good. They are good. And they will give you some, some, some additional 
ways of, of looking at some of the processes and going forward and trying to find um, uh, uh, these derived random variable distributions. In particular, there's two. Um, I might do a little bit of this um, just on the side, but there is something called a max and a min type of random variable. These are called order order, um, order statistic uh, um, variables. So where you're going to have, let's say, multiple random variables, and we want to know which one has the largest value. Let's just always select the largest or always select the smallest. Um, picking that max or min uh, will have its own distribution as well. And those are commonly encountered, and we need to be able to handle those. Those are generally a pretty straightforward case. Sums, um, sums, sums of RVs of RVs are also common. So all of these guys are common. These are common type of cases, looking at the smallest value out of a group of random variables, looking at the largest random variable out of a group of random variables, and summing up random variables. These are all ones that you should be able to handle. Let's do, just for fun, the idea of a, of a max or a min. Suppose I did this. Um, let's look at the max case as an example. We could let w be equal to what? It's the max of our two random variables known x and y, something along those lines. CDF method, um, which you which you uh, uh, can uh, base these things on, right, is going to be equal to FW of W. What is FW of W? It is the probability, right, that, well, what is it, W? If x is the max, right, then the probability of FW of W would be based on x, because x was the biggest one. So this is going to be the probability that x is less than or equal to W, in the condition that x is greater than y, because that means x is the max. And then I'm going to add to that, and we can add them here because they're mutually exclusive events, this idea that this is also adding to it the probability that y is less than or equal to w in the condition that y is greater than x. These two conditions that I just wrote out here, x being greater than y or y being greater than x, tells me which is the max variable. In the case that x is bigger, then it's x that's the largest one, and we are going to be interested in x being bounded by that value, little w. Same sort of an idea for y when y is the biggest one. So this CDF of w, right, is going to be a sum of two probabilities. If I was going to sketch this out, let's go ahead and look in the xy plane on this and see if we can get a handle on this. So I'm going to take a look in the xy plane. So here I have x and y going on in there. And I'm going to go ahead and look at the line that would be x equaling y. That turns out to be kind of important for us as well, something along those lines. I could look at this case of y being greater than x. Let's go ahead and call that case 2. x being greater than y, I'm going to go ahead and call that case 1. Which side of the line does each correspond to? Just pick a value. Like, come over here and pick x equaling 1 and y equaling 0, right? That's showing to the right and below of that of that 45 degree line. Well, one is greater than zero, so I know that's case one. So this um, to the right and below region is one, and the uh, above and to the left is going to be two, something along those lines. In either case, I'm looking at x or y being less than or equal to some w point. So I'm going to go ahead and grab a value that I'm going to call w comma w. Now, if I was in region 1, right, I'm interested in x being less than or equal to w. So there's my w, less than or equal to is going to be pointing in that direction. I only went up to the line because I'm only including those cases when x is greater than or y, right? If I, if I, if I, if I go ahead and shade that in, it looks something like that, where that goes off to infinity. We get this big, huge area somewhere in there. So that's that first case. If I look at the other case where y was the bigger one, right, then we need to see what's the probability that y is less than or equal to some w. Well, I find that same value w in the y, right? There it is. Um, oops, that should not have been a y. It should have been a w, a value w. And I'm looking that we're less than that, um, but that y was also the maximum one. So that's going to be uh, this other piece over there. And what we see out of there is we get this quarter plane, and we've seen this quarter plane before, right? This quarter plane is nothing more, right, than the than the CDF cap F XY of little w, little w, something along those lines. So when I'm wanting to find the CDF FW of W, right? We can get it from the CDF of our joint distribution X and Y using the point little w, little w, something along those lines. Great.
Now, if you wanted to, um, if this was from a, a pair of continuous random variables, you could get the joint probability density function just by differentiating that. If I wanted to look at something like the min case, um, so if I was going to look at, for example, uh, this is all under the min case, and these are all done in the book, so if you want some additional uh, context or example or, or a little bit more detailed derivation of this, go ahead and check it out in the book. Let's let v be equal to the min right, of x and y. So what is that? Um, we can again look at a CDF, FV of V, that is the probability, and it's gonna be again a pair of probabilities. It's the probability that X is less than or equal to V if what? X is less than Y. We use the value X when it's the smaller, and we add to that the probability, right, that Y is less than or equal to V when it was smaller, so Y being less than X. We can again call this first one uh, the case one, the second one case two, and I could go ahead and plot what this guy looks like as a, as a region in my xy plane. So here is x, here is y. We know that we're looking for when x or y is bigger, so that's going to be following that 90 degree, uh, the 45 degree line, um, and it's the same set of regions. One is above, two is below, and to the right, something along those lines. In the case that we are in region one, that means x were the smaller value, I'm interested in whether x is less than or equal to, to, to v, right? And so um, I'm going to go in there and let's just find a point, and I'm going to do it here and call this b and v. So when I was in region one and I'm looking for x having some, some value v, right? I'm interested in, am I less than or equal to that? So that's going to be anything there and to the left, right? So we're going to get this big region out there, something like that. If I do the second case, right, when, when it was uh, y, that was the smallest value. I'm looking for y being less than or equal to some value v. So here's the value v for y. Right? And I'm interested in whether we are less than or equal to that. So that's pointing down from there. And I shade that. I have to be in region 2 because we said we were basing this on, on the smaller value being y. And so that's going to give us this guy. It's kind of similar to what we saw for the max, right? But instead of a quarter plane, we see a three-quarter plane. It's uh, not quite a CDF, but uh, we can get it from the CDF for sure. So if I think about what, in terms of the joint uh, distribution CDF, uh, could be used to get this, uh, this set of probabilities, I could do it something like this. I could do it as f x of v plus an f y of v, and I'd subtract from that an fxy of v comma v. Let's see how that works. If I look at fx of v, what does that look like? So I come over here for some value x at v, and I go ahead and I find its accumulated probability. That looks like this. So let's go ahead and call that guy one, this next one's going to be two, and this last one's going to be three, something like that. So I've just drawn in there one. Number two is what? So number two is I'm looking for y being less than or equal to some value v. So I'm going to go ahead and throw in my value v there, this other one. Um, remember that vertical is y, horizontal is x. That's always been the case, so I could have put it over on the other one, something like that. And the CDF in terms of y is just everything there below, right? Now, if I added those two together, right, if I superimpose those two together, I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to go ahead and draw this out here. And I'm going to have a pair of points that are going to come up to this intersecting point. This is V comma V. If I added those two CDFs together in there, right, I would have ended up getting, I'll see how well this works. Um, the first one, right, is all these horizontal lines, something like that, right? And then all the vertical ones are going to be something like that. And what I see is one area got double counted, right? This part here has the crosshatch. That was double counted. So we need to get rid of that. But of course, I know what that is. That third one is my fxy v comma v, right? So we can easily get the CDF of either the max or the min, and some pictures can certainly help us with that. Again, some additional details are, are certainly available for us in the book on that. 
let's uh, let's work on a, a different example, one that's maybe um, just a little bit more um, involved and uh, related to one of those uh, sets of uh, of transformations that I had introduced just at the beginning, but that we didn't necessarily take anywhere. So this is going to be a case of two um, continuous random variables, and I would like to um, find something about um, the derived random variable. Um, behaviors, uh, something according to their model. So I'm going to do an example here where I'm going to let the random variable x be distributed as a uniform random variable on the interval 0 to 1. I'm going to let y be a continuous random variable that is also distributed as a uniform on the interval 0 to 1, something along those lines. And then I'm going to uh, create, I'm going to let there be a new random variable w that's going to be the ratio x by y, something like that. And what I would like to find on this is I would like to find both the CDF cap FW of W, and I'd like to find the uh, probability density function, little FW of little W, something along those lines. So I'd like to be able to find both of those. Okay, well, I think to start this out is I would like to get a little bit of an idea about um, what kind of space I'm looking at in here. So I'm going to go ahead and draw the xy plane, right? So I'm going to have x on the horizontal and I'm going to have y on the vertical. I know x is uniform 0 to 1, so between 0 and 1, that's where x can occur. And y is also uniform 0 to 1. There was no dependence that was indicated between these two. We could have said that uh, uh, explicitly if we wanted. We could have sat there and said that these guys are independent, that they are independent. And as an independent pair, what we are going to get in the joint distribution is that x can be between 0 and 1 and y can be between 0 and 1 and that means the result when I look at them in a pair is that they must be in that little square going from 0 to 1 on x and 0 to 1 on y. So the region of support right for my xy pair is just this nice little um, square. And because they were both uniform I know that the height there of my fxy in that region of support is one because that square has unit total area, something along those lines. So that's our original distribution. X is nice, Y is nice. Um, they both have that kind of just easy behavior. Let's think a little bit about what could happen with W. W is a ratio of X and Y. Um, I think there's a lot of things that can happen on this particular case. And um, we are going to be interested in trying to find out the distribution of this guy. We want the CDF, right? And we want, um, we want the PDF. Let's start out by thinking of at least an expression for the CDF. That's not the one I want. Let's get my pins back. And we know the CDF looks something like this. FW of little w, right, is equal to what? It's the probability that w is less than or equal to little w. Wouldn't get much further if I didn't know much more, but I know what w is. I have its mapping function. w is just x by y, right, being less than or equal to a specific value, little w, something along those lines, which is really equal to what? It's the probability that x is less than or equal to little w times y. So what's the probability that x is less than or equal to a scaled value of y, something along those lines? Well, I want to think about some, some different um, values of w. Remember, w is just x by y. Um, one value of w I could get is 1. If x happened to be equal to y, right, if x happened to be equal to y, I would have uh, x by y giving me a ratio of 1. When is x equaling to y? Well, that's this line right here, right? This is the x equaling y line, right? Which, if we look at it in a different way, that's the w equaling 1 line, something along those lines. So that would be a case of w equaling 1. I might look at some other cases, right? I might look at cases where, where that ratio, think about what would happen in this case if, if x got smaller for a particular value of y. If I started reducing the value of x in those cases, right, that's going to point me or pull me over. That's going to just be, if you look at the equation down here, x being less than or equal to wy, just write that as an equal. What is the condition we're looking at here? We're looking for x equaling wy, something along those lines. The boundary condition here is a straight line that always intercepts the origin who has a slope w, something like that. So I could look at a different one here, right? This is also equal to a line, something along those lines. In this particular case, I might be looking at, uh, at, a, at, a, at another one. 
um, I could have in this um, particular case my, my, my same expression. We know that this is still a w equaling x by y. It's just now it's for a different value of w. What different value of w would give me something like that y? Well, in this particular case, if I, if I wanted to look at it, um, I need something here. So x is equal to wy, or I could have written this as y equaling 1 over w x, something like that, the slope in a kind of standard way of writing that line is 1 by, by w. Here, this red line I've drawn has a pretty high slope, so I need a pretty big value. That should be a smaller value of w. It should be smaller than this original line here that we knew was w equaling 1. So I'm going to say everything that goes this direction is for w less than 1, right? If I make w less than 1, I'm going to start describing lines that make that slope get bigger because the slope was 1 over w. Similarly, if I make w greater than 1, I'm going to have lines that go in the other direction. So if I go like this, I'm going to have for the cases w being greater than 1, something along those lines. Turns out 1 is going to be important for us because that case w equaling 1 is right where I end up coming out and hitting that, that vertex over there. And some of the logic that we're going to be interested in is going to, is going to change depending on whether we're on one side of that line or, or, or the other. So um, let's uh, see what else we can do in here. In the limit, what would happen if I started looking at maybe something like this. That could certainly happen. Anything in green could happen in here, right? Anything in green could happen. If I have a really tiny value of x and a relatively large value of y, here's an example. There's a tiny value of x and a pretty large value of y. The resulting slope there is very is is very um, large, and that means the value of w is very small. And it's going to get to the point to where what? If we go totally vertical, right, that's going to be a slope of infinity. That's going to require w being equal to zero. So that very last one there, that straight vertical line, which is the last part of the green that we would incur, would be w equaling zero. Um, in the same sort of way, if I go to the other side, what would give me a horizontal line? That slope zero, um, the one over w is the slope. So what over um, what what value w is a one over w gives me zero? Well, that would be w going to infinity. So if I wanted to just clean this up a little bit, let me redraw this all out. Right, here's my original x y plane. So here's x and y. We know that we had a region of support that was a square. So 0 to 1, 0 to 1. We could go ahead and draw that in there. We're creating a derived random variable based on this x and y. My derived random variable, right, is w equaling x, y, y. There is the case when x equals y. That's this straight line here, which happens to be, so this is x equaling y, and it's also my w equaling 1. I know that I can go this direction, that's going to be w being less than 1, and I can go this direction, it's w being greater than 1. And at the very maximum right here, something like this, this is w equaling infinity, and this one over here right is w equaling 0. That does give me an idea about the range um, for w. S of w, right, is equal to the set of points w such that 0 is less than or equal to w, less than or equal to infinity. Uniform um, x and y on 0 to 1, when taken as a ratio, can create a new random variable, right, that is going to be on this interval 0 to infinity. Okay, so um, that's part of, the, part of the calculation we need to do. What are we actually looking for? So we said the CDF, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna re-highlight this. The CDF of W is this probability that X is less than or equal to WY. What side of the line, whatever line is it is, um, does that inequality correspond to? So I'm gonna come back down here and I'm gonna try to draw a particular line. So here's a particular line, right? That particular line is gonna be um, some, some W, right? Equaling X by Y. And I'm just curious, um, which side of the line would I be interested in? If I'm going to say I'm looking for the cases of x less than or equal to wy, which side of the line am I on on that? Well, let's just pick a point. Let's pick a point like 1, 1. That's an easy one to do. I know this is a value w that is less than that, right? Um, and so 
um, is 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 one right is one less than or equal to some number less than one times one so something like you know point five times one is one less than point five times one well no it's not so I think I picked the wrong side the side of the line for this inequality x being less than or equal to wy is going to be everything above and to the left so I'm going to be looking at something like that now, if I had had my line at a, at a different location that was more along the lines of y or w being large, right, I can do that as well. It's not going to be any different logic. It's the same sort of stuff. It's still the same inequality in there. So I'm going to be going 0 to 1 and 0 to 1. I still have my x equaling y line in there. And now I'm just looking at a particular line out here, a particular w, and I'm still going to be above and to the left. And so if I go ahead and put in my previous shade, this was the region of support for my x, y. And I'm trying to look at what values of x less than or equal to w, y would be involved there. It's going to be this trapezoid shape, right? Things that are above and to the left. And here's why I think that this line, x equaling y, is so important, right? If w is less than 1, the inequality x less than or equal to w, y is triangular, right? That's this piece. Right? Now, if, if I'm on a value of w larger than 1, right, then the inequality x less than or equal to wy is going to be a trapezoid. Right? And I think that um, it is possible that those integrations would need to be set up a, a, a little different. So let's go ahead and, and see if we can start actually, oh, I think we've got enough of the pictures going that we should be able to know what's going on here. Um, let's go back to what we were trying to do. We were trying to find the distribution of the derived random variable w, fw of w. We know that that random w, um, variable w, has a region of support, zero less than or equal to w, less than or equal to infinity. We could get that just by looking at some limiting cases of the xy in their region of support. If w of w, we know, was equal to the probability that x was less than or equal to w, y. We know that the shape that we would have to integrate on the x, y plane, this is a probability in terms of x and y. So that can be done from our joint distribution, right? We just need to figure out what part of the x, y plane to integrate. And we see that those are somewhat different looking based on whether w is less than or equal to 1 or whether it's greater than uh, 1. So let's take the first case. Let's look for, right, w less than, and you could do equal to 1 in this particular case. We'd already seen that. So we had our, our square going 0 to 1 and 0 to 1. And for w less than or equal to 1, right, we're going to be off of that, that 45 degree diagonal. And we know that we need to integrate, right, this little triangular, this little triangular piece in there, something along those lines. It doesn't really matter how I go about doing this. So um, in this particular case, my f w of w, it does equal, it is a double integral. We know that double integral, the probability density function, joint probability density function is 1. I'm going to go ahead in this particular case, and I'm going to write it out as a du dv. Let's just go ahead and do that. I don't think it's going to matter the order here. What does this order mean? du is our substitute variable for x. So I'm building things up in x first, right? So I'm going to be going things in x first, and then I'm going to stack them all together, right? What did we have for an expression here? We had w is that line as being x by y. If I solve that for x, I know that that is x being equal to w y, something along those lines. So I'm building up my x, right? And that x is always going from 0. That edge over there is fixed. So my lower limit here, as long as I'm doing x first, is 0. And the upper limit is that line, right? w equaling x by y. We find out the value of x for that, because that's what we're going out to. We're going out to some value x, whatever it is. And that x value is given by w little y, right? w little y. I don't want to get all confused in my variables of integration. That value y varies based on uh, where I am in the vertical stack. So I'm going to use my v in there. So that's going to be wv. So I have my wv in there. And then how many stacks do I do for that vertical stack? Well, y goes from 0 to 1, something along those lines. So I'm going to go ahead and carry out this integration. The, the first integral here is just an integral with respect to u of 1. That's going to give me u evaluated on the limits of integration there. That's going to be wv. 
and I'm going to still have my dv, and it's still going 0 to 1. Do that next one, I'm going to get a wv squared by 2 going from 0 to 1, and I end up getting in this particular case w over 2. So my probability um, uh, integration here, the integration of this joint probability density function, gives my CDF as being linear in W as long as W is less than 1. And we also know it had to be greater than 0. So we've got at least a portion of that. Uh, we need it for all the values of W greater than 1 now. So I'm going to go ahead and take a look at 4 w being greater than or equal to 1. Um, they should come out to being the same at that shared point if you would feel better about not doing greater than and equal to and just want to do greater than. It certainly could be done that way. All of that is fine in this particular case. In this particular case, I'm still looking at trying to find that, that CDF FW of W. Um, what am I going to be looking at? Well, we go in that XY plane. We want to base this on our random variables X and Y. We're looking at a line now that is below that 45 degree, right? So I'm still looking at W equaling X by Y. And I'm trying now to integrate that, that trapezoid looking area. X was on the horizontal, Y was on the vertical. If I still did my integral, as a vertical stack of a bunch of horizontal lines. I would be in a little bit of trouble here because the logic for this lower part, right, would go from zero out up until this line. And as I got higher in there, I'd eventually get a point where it goes from zero to a fixed. It wouldn't depend at all on that line. I don't want to integrate it this way. That's going to be the bad way to integrate it. So I'm going to switch in this particular case my order, right? I'm going to switch my order so that I can do this uh, simpler. You have some choices. You should always pick the choices that result in the least work. I can always go from this line, right, up to a fixed value of y being equal to not 2, but 1. And I could do that across all values of x. And that's going to be an easier way to go. So in this particular case, it absolutely absolutely makes a sense dv and then du. We want to do the vertical part first and then go ahead and do out the horizontal. We still have w equals xy. I'm looking for a value y. That is y equaling x by w. What is x though? That is just u. So my lower limit is going to be u by w, right? That's this point, right? u by w. And I'm going to be varying all these different values of u, the x variable going on its range of support from 0 to 1, something along those lines. And then I'm going up to an upper level of 1, something like that. And then what does x go on? It goes 0 to 1. So it's a very similar looking guy. I just interchanged the order because uh, that made this particular integration simpler. I'm going to start doing that as well now. So this uh, first integral on the inside, um, I'm integrating a constant 1 with respect to v. That just gives me v. Do it at the limits, and I'm going to get a 1 minus u by w, right? And then I'm going to be doing a du on there. If I integrate that second time, I'm going to get a u minus a u squared by 2, right? w, and I'm going to go 0 to 1 on that. And if I go ahead and carry that operation out, I'm going to get a 1 minus 2, whoops, not quite that, a 1 minus 1 by 2w. So in this particular case, I'm going to get a 1 by 1 minus a 1 by 2w, right? And then minus some 0. So it just ends up with that 1 minus 1 over 2w, something along those lines. Okay, I've covered all the different paces that I needed to. Um, the first case, right, handled all values of w that went from 1 until they hit 0, 0, right? And the second case in here went from any value w1 all the way up to w going out to infinity, both of those. I'm going to combine these together, and I should have my single expression for fw of w. fw of w in this case is equal to what, right? It is going to be 0, right, for w less than 0. Couldn't have happened. That's the small values. Nothing's accumulated. For 0 less than or equal to w less than or equal to 1, we've computed that out as being w by 2. And then the last part here was for w greater than or equal to 1, or I could have just done this as greater than 1, however you want to do it. Let's just do it as greater than 1. That gave me a 1 minus 1 over 2 w. What does this thing look like? Um, let's see if it makes some sense. I'm going to have in here, right, a CDF that was 0, 
have been accumulated for any value of w before its range state space starts at zero. No problem on that. In the case of my variable w coming up to a value of 1 between 0 and 1, its probability varies linearly as w by 2. So put w equaling 1 in there, and I'm going to end up with a value of 1 half. It's a straight line in between there, right? w equaling 0 would have given me 0, so I just get this nice straight line uh, kind of accumulation of probability. I could double that. That's going to get me to that final value of 1. Um, starting at w equaling 1, what do I get in that in that second expression? If we were just going to check, put w equaling 1 there, I'd get 1 minus 1 over 2 times 1, or 1 minus a half, or 1 half. It's that same point. Good. It's a functionally continuous, which I would have expected here. And then as w goes off to infinity, as w goes to infinity, um, what does this guy go to? I'm going to have 1 minus 1 over 2 times infinity. Anything over infinity is 0, that's just going to go to 1. 1 minus 0 is just 1. So this is something that should asymptotically, right, as w gets big, approach that value of 1. And it's going to do so in a, in a monotonically non-decreasing way, exactly as we'd expect with the CDF. So it's going to do something like that. This looks like a completely plausible CDF, right? Um, this thing uh, is, is changing, right, for the range space of W. And it's doing so in a way that is monotonically non-decreasing. It starts at a value 0, ends at a value 1, something along those lines. So I'm getting some pretty good confidence in that. I'll go ahead and, and mark this off as being my, my CDF that I've got on that. One more step here, and this is the easy step. We said that the probability density is generally easier. If you remember here, here we had fw of w being equal to what? It was 0 for w less than 0. It was w by 2 for 0 less than or equal to w less than 1. And it was what? 1 minus 1 over 2w, right, for w greater than 1. If I want to know the probability density, that's little fw of w. That's going to be equal to the derivative with respect to w of my fw of w. And I can do that piecewise. What's the slope of 0? Well, it's just going to stay 0 for w. That's not what I wanted for w less than 0. And the next one, what's the derivative of w by 2 with respect to w? Well, that's just going to be a half. So it's going to be um, a uniform, at least for this interval, 0 less than or equal to w less than 1. And then after 1, as it gets bigger than 1, w greater than 1, well, we can stretch out to an infinite number of values. There's no way it could hold on that value of a half. So I'm going to get the derivative of 1 minus 1 over 2w. So I'm doing a ddw of 1 minus a half w to the minus 1. The first constant goes to 0, right? The next one is going to be a half w to the minus 2. So that's going to be a 1 over 2w squared, something like that. So I can put a 1 over 2w squared, something along those lines. What does this guy go? We already know that this whole uh, probability density function, the f w of w, we know that that integrates to 1. How do I know that? Because it asymptotically approached 1 in the CDF. So I already know it's going to meet that. Um, I just need to be able to plot it out and get an idea of what the probability density looks like. We've got our expression now on this thing. So I'm going to go ahead and try to do it. For any values less than 0, those ones that weren't part of the range space, it was just 0 as expected. For 0 to 1, it's going to have a value of 1 half. Half the probability, right? Half the likelihood is being in that interval 0 to 1. That's no surprise. Go back to this plot up here, right? In the case of w less than 1, we were looking at anything from this line backwards. That was half of that, that little square. We'd expect half of the probability to be accounted for in there. And so that's all concentrated in that 0 to 1, and it turns out being uniform. After that, what do I follow? I follow a 1 over 2w squared, so a 1 over 2w squared. That's going to be decaying off something like this. It's going to asymptotically work its way to 0. Um, yes, larger and larger values of w are possible, but they become much less likely as w gets bigger, right? They, they become much, much less likely, something along those lines. If you wanted a really accurate plot of this guy, you absolutely could do so. Um, using uh, using a package like MATLAB. So our probability density function, right, um, is just this piecewise expression that we've done. Okay, so what have we done today? Um, we did talk a little bit about marginal distributions for continuous random variables, and then we also talked about this idea of looking at functions of 
more than one random variable, so functions of random variables. And we looked at a couple examples of doing like that. We, we, we briefly made uh, comments about the max and mins. Um, we laid out some basic procedures, whether it's discrete or continuous. And then we did a, a, a little more in-depth example of dealing with two continuous random variables and looking at a derived random variable um, that gave a little bit of a non-trivial um, kind of distribution. Maybe a little bit interesting that this, uh, this distribution comes out of something that was purely uniform, right? It came out of something that was purely uniform. That's it for this lecture. Um, we'll see you next time.